Good morning. So I always enjoy learning when I come to assembly and learned a couple of new songs today. At least they were new to me. I didn't know the Fruit of the Spirit song. I won't forget it. I'm glad to uh, learn that the coconut is not a fruit of the Spirit. I always thought it was an evil fruit. So, but uh, it's been good to be together. I had the privilege of teaching this morning the teen class, uh, Luke and Sarah and Jasper traveling. By the way, be pr- praying for them. They're uh, traveling between here and Arkansas and Texas over this week and back, and uh, they've been such a blessing to us. They're visiting family, so I got to teach his class this morning and uh, just want to say to parents and grandparents good job what a great group to be able to teach and to spend a few minutes with them I thank them for putting up with me during Bible class this morning there was a man uh, that was approaching the United States border from Mexico he was on his bicycle and he had two large bags over his shoulders. And the border border guard stopped him and asked him, what's in the bags? And the man answered, sand. And the guard said, well, we'll see about that. Get off the bike. And the guard uh, took the bags, ripped them apart, emptied them out, and found nothing in them but sand. And he decided to detain the man overnight and actually had the sand analyzed and, in fact, discovered that there was nothing in the bags but sand. So the guard released him and, and put the sand for him into new bags, heaved them up onto his shoulders and let him cross the border. A week later, same thing happened. The guard asked, what have you got? The man said, sand. And again, the guard went through his thorough examination, discovered that the bags contained nothing but sand. Gives sand back to the man. Man crosses a border on his bicycle. And this sequence of events is repeated every week for three years. Finally, one day, the man doesn't show up. And the guard just happened to come across him in a local restaurant. And the guard said, hey, buddy, I know you're smuggling something. It's driving me crazy. It's all I think about. I'm a wreck. I can't sleep. Just between you and me, what are you smuggling? And the man takes a sip of his drink and he says, bicycles. Mystery solved, right? Do you like mysteries? A lot of people do. I'm not crazy about uh, mysteries. I do like a certain kind of mystery, and that's the revealed kind. That's the kind of mystery you find reference to in the New Testament. Mysteries that have been revealed. And the neat thing is that that the key to every New Testament mystery is Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus, the mystery is solved. Tony Campolo was a theology professor in a secular college, and he had a student once who declared the following. The student said, for me to believe in God, I have to have a God that I can understand. And Campolo smiled and and replied, God refuses to be that small. So God refuses to be small enough for you and me to fully understand him. But that doesn't mean that we have to walk around without a clue. God has revealed things. And he has given us insight through his word. 
uh, into the great mysteries of life and um, life in this world and, and, and life in eternity. And once again, the key to it all is Jesus, his son. I want you to think with me for a few minutes about the New Testament letter of 1 Timothy. Now, as a Bible student, I'd ask you to, to um, recall what comes to mind when you think of this book, this letter that we know as 1 Timothy. I guess for a lot of people in church, uh, I would assume you would think that, you know, in 1 Timothy we are given a lot of instructions. We're given instructions of how to organize the church, um, especially the leadership of the church. We're given in, in chapter 3, for instance, of 1 Timothy, what are often called qualifications for elders and for deacons in the church. We have, if you've been in the church very long, um, over the years you have heard those passages referred to when it's time to appoint additional uh, deacons or elders. Um, we're going to be talking about those things in coming weeks and months. But there are other things in this letter. For instance, chapter 5, there are qualifications for widows, widows in the church. Did you, did you even know that there were qualifications for widows? There are. And um, I'd encourage you to read it sometime. We're going to be studying that on, in our Wednesday night study before too long. But throughout the six chapters of, of this letter, there are a lot of instructions and things like that, behavioral instructions, we might say, what to do and how to do it. In fact, um, look at, at what it says in chapter 3, verses 14 and following. Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. I think one of the things we see here is Paul tells us why he was writing this letter. He reveals the purpose of his writing. Verse 15, he says he's writing so that we might know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and buttress of the truth. I was often talked to by my parents about how to behave in church. Paul writes about how to behave in the church in the household of God. So a lot of instructions in 1 Timothy, a lot of commands and directions. We might say organizational blueprints for the church. There are some warnings throughout the letter about false teachers. But right here in the middle of it all, both literally at the midpoint of the book as well as right in the heart of the overall message, we have this verse 16, this mystery. Again, verse 16 says, Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. It's another of those really important 316 verses in the New Testament. There are a lot of great ones. You're probably most familiar with John 3.16, which a lot of people know. But there's also a really great, important verse in 1 John 3 
and verse 16. And here in 1 Timothy, the 3.16 verse is very important and worthy of, of attention. Have you ever given one of your children or students some instructions, told them what to do, and then have them say, why? Every, every parent's favorite question, why? Of course, we've all experienced that. And, and we might think of this verse in 1 Timothy, I guess, in a similar way. Um, Again, the letter is full of instructions and commands and directions from the apostle. And then here in this verse, at the middle of, of all of it, we get the answer to the question, why? Why should we do it this way, Paul? You have all these commands and directions. Why? Why should we do it this way? Why, for instance, do elders need to meet these standards, Paul? Why do we have deacons, Paul? Why is that important to have deacons and that they meet certain standards? Why, Paul, should we, we pray for kings? That's over in chapter 2, verse 1. He gives that command to, to pay for king, pray for kings. We might uh, translate it today to pray for politicians, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. Why should we do that? Why should we honor and care for widows? Why should we be careful about what we teach and, and watch out for those who teach falsely? Well, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16 is the why. It's the answer to that question. If you think any of those things that Paul spends his time on in this letter are unimportant. Look closely at 1 Timothy 3.16 because there he gives a reason for it. He gives a rationale. He says the mystery of godliness is great. But again, when we talk about mysteries in the New Testament, they are solved mysteries. They are revealed. They're revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the center of this letter. In fact, he's the center of the whole Bible. But right here, he's at the middle of 1 Timothy. And Paul says, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. What's the mystery that's been revealed? It's the gospel. It's the gospel. It's God's plan. We might call it God's plan of salvation. Now, I was taught the plan of salvation when I was a youngster in church. And the plan I was taught said, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live a Christian life. And I believe those things, and I support them, and I preach them. I think they're all important. In fact, I think they're all essential in responding to God. But a person may hear us make that list or something similar and say, why? Why that list? Why those steps? Do you have an answer for that? Well, the answer is the same as here. The answer is Jesus. Jesus is the reason. I think the contents of 1 Timothy 3.16 might actually be better called the, the plan of salvation, God's plan of salvation. What we read here in 1 Timothy 3.16, and then the steps that I quoted a moment ago, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live a Christian life, our response to God's plan of salvation. Because here in 316, we get God's plan. There are six steps to it once again. Notice, six lines here in this verse, and you can really break them down into three couplets, 
Three sets, two lines each. Not hard to remember. Worthy of memorizing, I think. Notice set number one. The first two lines is the gospel conceived or initiated, if you will. Now, in this verse, I want you to, to pay attention that, that the name Jesus is not mentioned, but it's clearly describing him in all these things and what God has done through Jesus. So set number one is this. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit. Manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit. The good news conceived. The gospel initiated. Jesus, the Son of God, became man. He took on flesh. The big word for that is he was incarnated. That really tells us two important truths. The first, of course, is he took on flesh. And, and, and that's, that's what it says. But also notice it reminds us that he existed before that. He is God. He is God, and as God, he is eternal. There was a time before he took on flesh. And he existed then as well. And so we have the incarnation of Christ and the pre-existence of Christ taught in this little Short phrase, these four or five words. Again, he was manifested in the flesh. Think about the power of that brief phrase. Really important words, aren't they? He was manifested in the flesh. And then it says, vindicated by the Spirit. Manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the Spirit. The gospel initiated. Scholars have, have sort of suggested several possibilities about what this particular part of the phrase is referring to, and maybe all of them have merit, but you know, we know that the Spirit was behind the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary. We know the Spirit appeared at Jesus' baptism. And when when it did, God spoke his divine approval of his beloved son. By the way, that occurs in another important 316 verse in the New Testament, Matthew 316. And obviously, by the power of God through the Spirit, Jesus was raised from the dead. By all these things, Jesus was vindicated. He was shown to be right. By all of them. All the doubters and detractors were proven wrong. Jesus was vindicated by the Spirit, by the power of God. Manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit. The gospel conceived, initiated. Set number two. The second two lines in 1 Timothy 3.16 are these. Seen by angels... Proclaimed among the nations. Here we have the gospel communicated. The gospel communicated. The good news proclaimed. It was communicated in the spiritual world. Seen by angels. And also in the natural world. Proclaimed among the nations. So this mystery. God's gospel plan has not been hidden. And we shouldn't be hiding it. It's never been hidden. It's been revealed. It's a revealed mystery. It's an open secret now. This stuff, this gospel stuff, was not done in a corner. It was not done someplace where no one could see it. Everyone has a chance to know it. Angels saw it. The world has been told it. It's been communicated. And it's being communicated as we speak. And remember again what, what this is all about. This is the answer to the question 
the big question, why? Why should we be concerned about this? Why should we be concerned about what Paul writes in 1 Timothy, for example? Stuff about elders and deacons and, and teachers and widows and, and praying for kings and all those things. Why, why does it matter? Here's the why. The why is Jesus. The why is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ has been manifested and vindicated. It has been seen and proclaimed. That's why we're dealing with truth. We are dealing with God's way. You know, we get a, a great summary here of the things we believe. Uh, in 1 Timothy 3, 6, 16, the, the things of the Christian gospel. And what we come to find out is that our beliefs and, and our behaviors are intimately tied together by God. Belief and behavior is connected. Anytime we try and separate the two, we mess things up. Look at the final set of three. The third set of two lines in this great verse. What's it say? Believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Believed on in the world, taken up in glory. The gospel continued. Isn't it amazing that we're allowed to be part of this? That we're allowed to be a part of the gospel, this mystery of godliness revealed? This gospel has been believed on by people like us in this world. We're a part of it. We have believed on Jesus and obeyed him, and so we are a part of God's great plan. And then the last line, taken up in glory, that includes us as well. Taken up in glory. Initially, this, this refers to Jesus' ascension. Uh, it's probably the least thought about gospel event among all the gospel events. You know, we don't preach or teach much about the ascension of, of Jesus to God's right hand, and that's unfortunate because it's really important. Remember how Luke relates the, the account, story of Jesus' ascension. For example, in the book of Acts, Jesus is talking to his disciples and just suddenly it says he is lifted up. He's lifted up from them and a cloud conceals him and takes him from their sight. Then two angels come. And, and speak to the disciples and tell them that one day Jesus will return in the same way they've seen him go. What does that mean? Well, at least it means visually. They saw him ascend. We will see him descend. We're involved in this. Every eye will see him, Scripture says. Every eye. He will once again be fully God and fully man. He will return to judge all the earth. And he will take his people back to heaven to be with God forever. The gospel continued forever, eternally. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. You see what an important verse this is. It's the answer to our why question. You ever wonder why? why? Why these instructions? Why this teaching? Why this way, God? Why do you want me to do it this way? The answer is Jesus, the gospel. Conceived, communicated, and continued. 
And we do well to keep this in mind whenever that question comes in our mind. Why? Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, for the goodness that you have showered upon us, the opportunity to be your people, to be called into a relationship with you. Help us not to take for granted the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. Father, help us this week to live those things out so people can really see the hope that is within us because of what you've done. Help us now to uh, make our commitments to you for this week, to live for you boldly and before others kindly and with great love. Thank you for hearing us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we extend an invitation. It's a tradition we have and we might ask why. Why do we do this? Well, it's not because we have a verse that says do this at the end of a sermon. But it's a good thing when we assemble to give people an opportunity if, if they need to make a change in their life and they need strength of prayers like you to pray for them or if they need to say yes to Jesus for the first time and, and obey his gospel. That obedience being a reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in water. That's why. That's why we take a time, sing a song, and encourage people to think about their relationship with God. Today, if you need to respond in some way, we're, we're ready to help you in whatever way we can. Please think about it while we stand, while we sing.